Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Arvind Panagriya, Mr. Sanjay Kirloska, Mr. C.K. Ranganathan, I need to start this session with an apology. Uh, we thought we had sent the link to Professor Panagriya, but unfortunately, uh, we hadn't apparently sent it. And my real apologies to you. We kept you waiting for uh, half an hour. But uh, thank you so much for joining in. And once again, apologies to you and apologies to all the delegates that we have kept waiting. But many thanks for joining us at the IMA National Management Convention and for agreeing to do the session on curing the economy from COVID's effects. You have been forthright in your views about what is the right way to go about reviving the economy. And it is exciting to have an opportunity to hear your prescription for economic rescue and rehabilitation. Thank you, Mr. Kiloskar and Mr. Ranganathan for joining this conversation. Ladies and gentlemen, the disruption caused by COVID has shaken the conventional economic wisdom and stirred a new reform drive in the government. To mitigate the economic disruption, the government has injected additional liquidity and credit into the financial system and liberalized the MSME and agriculture sectors. It is trying to help domestic industry by raising barriers against imports. It is also trying to attract foreign investment and manufacturing by persuading states to make land and labor available with minimum regulatory compliance. However, the policy response to the crisis has raised concerns that the long-term impact of the short-term measures. So what would be the right measures to take forward, to take going forward? It would be great to get Professor Panagriya's view on the same. But before we do that, it is my pleasure to invite Mr. Sanjay Kirloska, President Aima, to conduct the session. Thank you, Rikar. Dr. Uh, Arvind Panagreya, former Vice Chairman Niti Ayo, and Professor of Economics, Columbia University. Mr. C.K. Ranganathan, Vice President IMA, and Chairman and Managing Director, Cabin Care Private Limited. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to have you and a very warm welcome to everyone in this session. In this session, we will have a conversation with one of the leading economic gurus of our times, Professor Arvind Panagreya, Professor of Economics, and the Jagdish Bhagwati Professor of Indian Political Economy at Columbia University and former Vice Chairman of Niti Aayog. Professor Panagriya, a very good morning to you. It is a privilege to have you and many thanks for agreeing to share your thoughts on rehabilitating our economy from COVID's impact. You have been very vocal about how India can be bold when others are afraid. As Vice Chairman of Niti Aayog, in the first three years of the incumbent administration, you shaped the policy thinking of the first Modi administration, and your opinion carries weight in the corridors of power. You've also had a say in global economic affairs because of your involvement with the World Bank, IMF, UNCTAD, and Asian Development Bank. Your ideas and work were valued by the UPA regime also, which conferred the Padma Bhushan on you in 2012. This is a wonderful opportunity to interact with you and learn from you. Thank you for joining us today and a very warm welcome again to you. Ladies and gentlemen, COVID has rocked the world. It has made more than 25 million people or 30 million people sick and killed nearly a million. India has suffered heavily as its COVID cases have shot past 5 million and its daily infections have risen by tens of thousands since August. Our economy has shrunk by nearly a quarter during the April to June financial quarter. Private consumption fell by more than a quarter while investment declined by nearly a half. Construction was down by a half and man the manufacturing drop was about 40%. Agriculture was the only bright spot with a 3.4% growth in output. Our government has tried to shore up the diving economy with a 20 lakh, rupee, 20 lakh crore rupee stimulus, mainly made up of credit and liquidity measures. The government has also come up with the idea of making India self-reliant in order to boost local industry and jobs. India is trying to enter a quick fix trading pact with the US to source investment and technology and to boost exports. However, there are pros and cons of every policy choice. And who better than Professor Panagria to explain to us what would work and what would not. 
This is going to be a freewheeling session. I will kick off by asking Dr. Panagria to share his initial thoughts, followed by a few questions. I will then request our Vice President, Mr. C.K. Ranganathan, to ask a couple of questions. And I would then request the audience to post their questions to Dr. Panagria, and we'll take that up during our conversation with him. So, uh, Professor, I leave it to you. Uh, maybe your initial thoughts, and then I will follow that up with my first question. Thank you, Mr. Kirloska, and uh, uh, very uh, uh, pleased to be with uh, you all. Um, uh, it's an honor to be invited to speak. Uh, I'll just take five or six minutes to give some initial thoughts, uh, because I think it will be much, uh, much better uh, uh, to leave much of the time for Q&A. Um, so let me just first say that we already have the numbers now for April, June quarter, uh, and the GDP fell by about 24%. Um, many of the analysts have sort of said uh, that, you know, interpreted this decline as a sort of continuation of the decline that was going on in the growth rate uh, starting from the first quarter of 2018-19. Uh, and so, you know, we had a declining trend of growth rate uh, uh, for the eight quarters uh, preceding the COVID. Um, and so, you know, the, these analysts seem to have taken the view that somehow uh, 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 even absent COVID, we would have seen a very significant fall of the kind that we have seen. I think that's a very misguided view. Uh, really, the much of the decline is due to COVID. And that is corroborated by the fact that other countries that were uh, hit hard by COVID have had similar declines in the April, June quarter. So uh, if you look at uh, United Kingdom, 22% decline, uh, Spain, 22% decline, uh, Italy, which was on this uh, COVID on a little bit earlier, so even before uh, perhaps the, the, the uh, first quarter began, uh, had about 18%. Uh, the United States actually is lower, 9.5%, but that's largely because uh, of two reasons. One, uh, the uh, first round of uh, or first wave of COVID in the United States uh, was smaller when uh, where only New York State was impacted badly. Uh, and, and also the lockdown in the United States was not as severe as in, the, as, as in India. Likewise, if you look at the sectors uh, which have been hit hard, construction, transportation, hotel, uh, manufacturing, mining and querying, these are sectors where the lockdown was much more effective. Agriculture, where there was virtually no lockdown, uh, more or less kept growing on its trend uh, value. Public administration uh, 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 fall was much less. Um, so, uh, you know, electricity, which flows on the wire anyway, uh, uh, again, didn't show a large decline. So the sum of it really to me is that the, 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 the decline is due to COVID and really getting the economy back to uh, the original uh, uh, trajectory of 7% plus, uh, which is where we were in the first four years of, uh, you know, 7.7% 7 .7 in the first four years of Modi government. Uh, that's where we need to go back. And uh, the first thing we will need to do is to uh, 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 gain victory over COVID. And that, of course, may, means bringing the, the vaccine as quickly as possible. So uh, one thing I've been pitching uh, 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 is, is that, you know, I did some back of the envelope calculation just within one quarter, uh, that is the, uh, the April, June quarter. India lost easily by even very conservative kind of calculation about $125 billion. Uh, uh, you know, we, that is the loss we need to really avoid. And for that, I think, you know, uh, overcoming the COVID challenge is the key. And therefore, I think we need to invest far, far more heavily in the vaccine right away, you know, we, because even after vaccine gets approved, it will have to be manufactured and it will have to be administered. So whatever it takes both for manufacture of uh, vaccine and for administering vaccine, we should make massive investment now. Uh, some we have done, but it's not, scale is not large enough. We ought to go in with at least five to seven billion dollars worth of investment in five or six of the leading vaccines. Even if two or three of those uh, don't pan out uh, and just two or three do pan out, I think it will pay off. Because remember, we are losing easily one and a half billion or so every day that the recovery gets delayed. So that's my first 
prescription what we need to in terms of what we need to do uh, once we return and you can see the signs you know as workers are returning uh, 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 the, the the recovery is happening uh, in august pmi uh, uh, for manufacturing went up to about 52 even for services it went up uh, in august uh, to about 42 from something like you know in the 20s uh, in in april uh, electronic sales have uh, electronic item sales also rose up about in august 40% over their value uh, uh, in august 2019 so as workers return i am personally confident that the economy will return to the 7% plus growth trajectory uh, the, uh, where, where we were. Now, in terms of a few measures, very quickly, I'll take <laughs> maybe one more minute, uh, which is uh, uh, I would still pitch for uh, the RBI to, to lower the interest rate. I think we need uh, that stimulus there. RBI should also intervene in the foreign exchange market to ensure that the rupee doesn't get appreciated because we need the foreign demand as well. Uh, uh, from the government side, we'll need some fiscal stimulus. Uh, I, I think infrastructure building acceleration is the key to that. Uh, some transfers could be made. We can come and talk about that. Uh, we will also, we should also go much faster for bank recapitalization. Uh, uh, last time we have made a mistake. I think, you know, we are much slower to get there. We should get there faster. And finally, I think, you know, the government is going to need revenues. Uh, 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 because the debt to GDP ratio is going to shoot up. Uh, to avoid that, uh, to at least partially, uh, we need to privatize in a big way, uh, as well as monetize the uh, uh, assets like the roads, bridges, uh, 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 transmission lines, uh, uh, ports, airports, etc. A uh, lot of scope there to raise uh, non-tax revenues, uh, and that is another thing we will need to do. So that's roughly uh, my sort of summary comments, uh, and we can uh, elaborate on some of these as we uh, go into Q&A. Thanks very okay. much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, because you know it's good to point out that other countries also are in a similar situation in the first quarter, that our uh, decline is not this uh, far away from other Western developed countries. And I believe that uh, what you said in the last one minute is a sort of a prescription as to how we could cure the economy from uh, COVID's effects uh, for the long term and making the economy more uh, resilient. So, uh, you know, you have said that the Indian economy has the potential to grow at 10% annually for two decades after COVID. Uh, but the policy of import substitution uh, could reduce that growth rate uh, by 2%. Uh, could you please elaborate on that? And, you know, we'd also like to have your views as to how Atman Nirbhar Bharat fits in the larger scheme of economic reforms and how it would change resource allocation and benefit distribution. All right. So first, the first question, so there are two questions you asked about. One is about yeah. Atman Nirbhar Bharat and the first is about trade. They're related, but uh, the, 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 for the first one, um, you know, in the history, uh, uh, there are only four or five cases where economies have grown eight to 10%. You know, you could start with Japan, but uh, among the developing countries really post second world war, uh, you got South Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, Hong Kong, China, I think those are the five. Uh, not a single one of those has grown without being extremely open and capturing the global markets and for good reasons. Uh, you see, it, when you operate in the global markets, uh, you take advantage of the scale economies. Uh, because even, you know, for particular products, uh, the domestic markets are not large enough. For instance, you know, even take the auto automobile, uh, our scale today is far smaller than the, you know, large number of small plants uh, and not large ones, but this becomes even much, you know, uh, I, I, in other sectors, you know, it's, it's even uh, more pronounced. Uh, Global market is about 17, 18 trillion in merchandise exports and another 7 trillion uh, in services. So you've got about $25 trillion market. That's where the big demand is. That's where, you know, if you're efficient, then that's where you operate. Also, when you compete in the global economy, uh, 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 you're competing against the best. So you have to put out your best. Whereas when you compete in the protected market, what you are doing simply is that, you know, you are keeping out uh, any problems you have domestically. You're trying to kind of neutralize for that by keeping out the imports, making them less able, right? You know, we, we fight when we protect, we fight our disabilities 
<laughs> by uh, creating disabilities for those who compete with us. Uh, that's not the way. I think we should remove our disabilities, which means doing the reforms and, and, and uh, uh, bringing our own costs down, raising productivity. And, and that happens by competing, uh, by learning from the best in the world, uh, uh, through adoption of innovation, but also good management tech techniques, uh, everything you do. So, you know, it really, openness is extremely critical. So if we, if we really veer from that, uh, uh, you know, I don't think we can get to 10%. Nobody has done that, uh, 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 to my knowledge, uh, uh, anywhere. So now how does that fit in the art neighbor Bharat? Now, my worries on trade side, which I have often expressed, uh, have had to do uh, uh, with something that already started, you know, uh, this, this has been going on for three years or more, you know, this whole import substitution business. And Art Nirbhar Bharat to me is sort of unrelated to that. It, I, I think when Prime Minister introduced this, uh, he was speaking to the larger Indian audience, meaning, you know, all the people of India, including particularly, especially, I think, in rural India, uh, and so this was confidence building measure to me, to me I, you know, this is a way of building confidence. Uh, uh, that people that look, you know, we should be self-reliant. Uh, we should not have to depend on, but that doesn't mean, you know, I mean, even in our households, for example, when we are self-reliant, all it means is that, you know, we don't incur debt. We don't uh, depend on somebody giving us handouts. Uh, what we mean is that we earn our own living. It doesn't mean that don't exchange with anybody, you know, I mean, uh, even in the U.S., I'm self-reliant in this, only in the sense that, uh, you know, I pay my bills. Uh, but I'm not self-sufficient, you know, I sell my services to Columbia University and then buy whatever I need from everybody else with the income that I generate by selling my services to Columbia University. It's the same thing, you know, uh, uh, in effect. And what we want to do is to buy from whoever gives us the products the cheapest and sell to whoever gives us the highest prices. Uh, and that is done by simply being very open to trade. Uh, uh, certainly to me, self-reliance doesn't imply anything about uh, 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 trade being closed down. Uh, that was a separate process that was underway, uh, uh, which, which, we, which I would like to actually reverse uh, as well. So that's roughly, you know, where I come out. Okay, because I, I think uh, Atmanirbhar Bhar, to my mind, doesn't mean blocking everyone else. It means opening up, because otherwise we are not going to get technology, our skills, uh, our workers are not going to get uh, upskilled. The technology that we need, we have to get from countries outside, and therefore we have to allow them into our markets as well. Absolutely. Uh, you spoke about uh, global competition and trade. Uh, you seem to have opened, uh, changed your mind about India not joining the RCEP agreement after China's aggression on the India border. Uh, what kind of trading regime do you foresee in Asia with RCEP, and what do you, what kind of impact? do you think it will have on India? Yeah. So I still think that, you know, it, it is not time for us to close any markets with respect to China. Uh, we, we have to continue trading. But what I have said is that, you know, China cannot be trusted. Uh, and uh, 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 what that means is that, you know, if we had actually gone into an RCEP kind of an arrangement and gotten much more integrated with China economically, uh, uh, because it is the PLA, and uh, the Communist uh, uh, Party, uh, which uh, really call the shots, uh, it will not stop them from using uh, our uh, integrated trade relationship against us, uh, should that suit them strategically. So we don't want to be in that situation, but at the same time, you know, there's no reason for us to uh, severe the connection. Uh, what we ought to do is uh, distance ourselves. And for that, I have said, you know, we should uh, try to start off with, uh, free trade agreements, both with the uh, European Union, the United Kingdom. Now, as far as Asia is concerned, you know, the field is quite open. I think we, there has been some uh, some uh, minister level talks for in, uh, between, say, Japan, Australia and India. I think we ought to expand that process uh, with the other ASEAN countries, uh, uh, also with uh, uh, South Korea, for instance. South Korea is a very vibrant economy. Uh, we ought to uh, upgrade our relation, you know, trade relationship with uh, South Koreans as well. Uh, we seem to be sort of, you know, very um, caught up in this that somehow we have not benefited from the free trade agreements that we signed with Japan and South Korea. My own reading is not that. I, I think, you know, uh, uh, those agreements have done fine. And, and you know, the, in, I, I, it doesn't, once you take into account the fact that all trade has expanded and therefore our imports from these countries have expanded as well. 
uh, but our exports have also expanded uh, and maybe they were not all equal and symmetric and so forth but you know the whole idea of free trade agreements is to be open and to me if we can you know open up without any free trade agreements so much the better i mean you know if we can go down to uh, uh, somewhere uh, uh, 5 7% tariff levels uh, or even lower i mean i'm free trade economist so i have no problem if you go to free trade that may not be feasible politically but you know if we if we at least lower so we have to do one or the other i mean you know uh, either lower tariffs uh, against everybody or against some countries with which we have good economic good political relationship geopolitical equation is good you know these are largely going to the western economies united states uh, european union and the united kingdom canada australia japan so when I mean, those are the countries then if we are not going to to reduce tariffs across the board against everybody then let us at least do it through free trade agreements so that that i think is what i see but there are plenty of countries you know look the global economy is vast uh, as i said 25 trillion dollars uh, mm -hmm. and and our share in it is not even 2% uh, so we need china about in merchandise export china has a share of 12 to 13% that's where we need to head at least get 4 5% of that uh, well, very very large pie okay uh, you are talking about trade agreements and uh, what i have uh, heard recently is that you propose that india sacrifice the interests of domestic manufacturing industry to strike a trade deal with europe instead of sacrificing the interest of indian farmers to do a deal with the us uh, i don't know how correct that is but i am a manufacturer so i am a <laughs> little concerned with that uh, how do you see the indian government going about making trade deals yeah look one thing uh, uh, um, uh, uh, that's not how i put it you know okay. I, I, i simply <laughs> said that i simply said that politically uh, i mean i personally don't think that our farmers will fail to compete yeah. so if we were to actually cut a deal with the united states uh, uh, what i what i said was the us will not cut a deal without us opening up our farm mm -hmm. meaning our uh, agricultural market mm -hmm. to the us farmers uh, uh, they will not do that uh, a deal that uh, leaves agriculture out Uh, and that will also be contrary to the wto rules uh, frankly speaking um, and so that is where i i said i personally think that our farmers will compete i mean look and so also therefore when i say that you know uh, 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 for example we can open the auto in, auto manufacturing i think our auto industry will eventually come out stronger out of it yeah uh, look you know protecting the industry doesn't mean that shield the industry from any competition uh and and it also does not mean that nobody will be hurt by it the whole idea of competition uh, uh, you know is, is simply that uh, the 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 uh, uh, those who are inefficient are actually do do exit and that, that is in the overall interest of the country uh and the more efficient ones get to expand yeah. and we expand our scale so you know the, as i said global market you know even in automobile probably over a trillion dollar worth of market we haven't got even 1% share in it largely because our auto industry has uh, as protected behind 100% tariff plus 100% plus tariff has simply not become as competitive uh, so it just hasn't got that uh, uh, extra to compete and also a lot of the foreign manufacturers have come in for with very small plants uh, basically to get the domestic market mm -hmm. uh, that doesn't make for an efficient auto industry either so some there is no the whole point of the competition is restructuring continuous restructuring with the uh, vibrant industry vibrant firms uh, winning out uh, inefficient ones uh, losing out uh, so some you know that's the nature of the business i mean you know in my own business <laughs> as academics you know if we don't reduce if we don't compete uh, we go into oblivion i mean we, we, it, it is and that's what brings the best out of us that you know if you really have to compete continuously and we are judged not by what we did 20 years uh, in, in the past 20 years we are judged by what did we produce last year you know what did we do last year uh, what is he going to do tomorrow uh, you know so that's what measures and that's the kind of competition we need to institute uh, so you know this when we say protection who are we protecting the buyer wants to buy the product the seller wants to sell the product who is being protected by the tariff you know you're stopping the, it's anti protection if you think about it you know <laughs> so uh, 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 and don't forget our own experience 
when we started this uh, liberalization there was so much opposition in 1991 but look what happened 2002 india's merchandise exports were just 50 billion dollars 50 billion dollars 9 years later by 2011 300 billion six fold nothing expended uh, uh, more than uh, uh, our exports actually during those 9 years six fold i mean even the economy actually gdp did not become six fold uh, within that 9 year period so you know this is a, a bit of this uh, uh, confusion that somehow uh, uh, our our firms can do better uh, if we keep the competition uh, uh, away especially competition from foreign firms away uh, it's quite the contrary actually you know if you look at it overall growth Uh, and remember that nine year period 2003 to 2011 we grew about uh, 8.2 percent that was a, a, that is the growth rate over a nine year period that we have not repeated uh, or ever done before either so uh, i i don't think it's a lose lose it is a win win uh, except that yes it intensifies competition so everybody has to work a bit harder if you remember the head of the so called bombay club mr rahul bajaj exported 15 million bikes now so yes. you know it's all, it's, it was good for him. my own farm we export to about 120 com- countries around the world look at that and we own factories in western europe and america and you know what it has taught us is that to compete on a global scale your products need to be the best your finish needs to be good your products need to be reliable and th- only then can you compete it, it makes us better Absolutely. if we face global competition absolutely and 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 then the you know the 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 market is vast you know once you convince the customers then there is no end i mean that you are limited only by your ability to expand but as long as you can yeah. continue to expand there is no limit to the market you see so uh, uh, there, there is no uh, 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 equivalent of the global marketplace in this sense i've been asking all the questions uh, there are questions from the audience and uh, Mr Ranganathan is also going to ask you a few questions and I will have to move to go to the next session but anyway uh, there are uh, you know a few questions and one is a very uh, one question is uh, as of today he says uh, stock markets went down today reasons are european countries are going for the next phase of lockdown markets overvalued profit book- booking what is your opinion professor well you know stock market <laughs> the markets don't reflect what is going on today stock markets look to the future uh, and so therefore it's it's very hard but there is also a bit of speculation and all you know we have all seen the uh, topsy turvy stock market market we have seen in the us uh, in the last two weeks right you know they because these are com- complex markets there were all kinds of call options uh, 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 that were being uh, uh, exercised or traded and that also had uh, had their impact on the, the stock prices but largely i think you know stock markets reflect what is the future and i think mm. you know from that perspective uh, our stock market generally has actually now begun to show up right uh, a lot of foreign mm-hmm. capital is coming in uh, and they are coming in and remember the foreign investment is really flowing into our country including into the stock market and that reflects the general confidence that the indian economy will do well over the longer run yeah Uh, the next question is uh, what sort of adjustment should be made to india's monetary and fiscal policy to support the corporate ecosystem now i don't know whether this is a trick question or um, who has asked this question but your <laughs> take no no no, uh, no tricks for uh, for me you know i have straightforward uh, 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 i am a straightforward person so uh um, no i have said already that on the monetary side you know i i would not be bogged down by inflation uh, because supplies will respond you know a lot of the in my reading uh, april june inflation was higher uh, uh, to a considerable degree uh, some of it was in agriculture in in the, in the food inflation uh, but uh, to the extent that it was not in food it was also because of the very large supply shock uh, you know mm-hmm. supplies had shrunken uh and you know a lot of people at that time were saying that the demand will become a problem obviously demand did not become a problem which is why your inflation remained 6 to 7% during those 3 months uh but i think supplies are responding therefore actually the the pressure on inflation will be down uh i would pitch for uh, uh, cuts in interest rates i mean whatever uh, and uh, continued provision of good liquidity uh i think that's something the reserve bank uh, uh, must do uh um uh, uh 
I'm not an inflation hawk. I, I simply think that you know, uh, uh, keeping inflation below four percent, or you know, which often ends up translating, you know, closer to two percent rather than four or six. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't go for that. You know, I I think uh, six to seven percent inflation we can tolerate, uh, and it's good, for, actually healthy for the economy because that's where the, you know the the profits are all all seen in nominal terms, and growth in profits is seen in nom nominal terms, and for the industry's confidence, a little bit of inflation is actually not. A, a, a bad thing to have, uh, so I lean kind of on on, on a bit more liberal uh, monetary policy. Mm -hmm. uh, but I also lean on the RBI ensuring that the exchange rate uh, remains competitive, meaning you know that the rupee doesn't uh, appreciate. Uh, because at the end of the day, what you get for exports depends on uh, what the exchange rate is very critically. So that's very important, and rupee has appreciated in the last month or two uh, a bit, largely because. You know, I think the RBI simply couldn't keep up purchasing the dollars that were flowing in at a very high rate, uh, but it has to accelerate that rate of purchase of dollars to 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 keep the rupee uh, at a competitive rate. Okay. Uh, I now request our Vice President, Mr. C.K. Rangamathan, to uh, take over and ask a few questions. He will also be delivering the concluding remarks, and I'll be uh, as, long, as long as I can be. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Any other questions from the audience, or you want to ask the last question? Then I will take over from that from the audience. No, if you have any questions, or uh, there, there is uh, questions from the audience as well. Yeah, one question you can say, and then uh, subsequently I'll take over. Okay. One, uh, so say. the next question is: Is the farm, new farm bill going to help the agricultural sector and support the GDP? Uh, okay. So. Uh, to the first part of it, unqualified yes. Uh, uh, this is uh, these are reforms that we have been. I mean, I have written for more than uh, ten years, more than a decade. Uh, and 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 the, uh, the the origins of these reforms actually go back to Prime Minister Vajpayee and all you know who had uh, muted the uh, APMC Model Act, which never got properly implemented. So I think that that's. A, Big, big kind of uh, uh, plus for the farmers, particularly who are given the option to sell their product not anywhere that they want to whoever they want, uh, and it also opens the door for uh, contract farming. You know where uh, farmers can get an assured price for the quality of the product, and they will also be supported for whoever they sign the contract with uh, in terms of technology seeds, etc. So big plus. Uh, uh, will, it, will it support the GDP? Now, one thing you know, it's a it's it's it it it, it is something that's a bit of a, a uncomfortable thing to 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 say and, and and hear, but that is a fact. That as far as the GDP growth is concerned, agriculture is not particularly important anymore. Unfortunately, uh, uh, you saw that agriculture continued to grow at three point four percent in this quarter, the April June quarter. Uh, but it did not stop uh, at all the decline of 24%. And that's because agriculture is less than 15% today. Agriculture cannot grow on a long-term basis, cannot grow more than 4%. I mean, you can take the average of the last, uh, since 1950, we have the data. And that growth rate is less than 4%, three and a half at the most. Now think about it, 15% share. And even if it grows 4%, that's a 0.6% you know, just multi do the multiplication and it's 0.6% contribution to the GDP growth. That's the best it can do, even in the best of the times. So at the end of the day, agriculture is important for India only because too many people depend on it. Almost 42% of our workforce is in agriculture and uh, it should not be that way. I think, you know, ultimately the salvation of uh, farmers lies in becoming something other than farmers for, for more than half of them, not everyone, but more than half of them. Uh, uh, one, one simple statistic which I like to point out, today, 70 million farms in India, 70 million, which are 48% of all land holdings, 48% of all land holdings, numbering 70 million today, are smaller than half hectare, half hectare, I'm not even talking two hectare, I'm talking half hectare. Every size of these holdings is less than a quarter hectare, just 0.23 hectare. On such a small farm, you know, you can double the farmer income, you can triple the farmer income, can't go very far. They need alternatives. And this is where my pitch always, industry and services have to do a lot better. Medium and large firms have to come up, which have high productivity, uh, which can then provide decent jobs uh, and the workers can therefore migrate to those. I think that's my sort of, you know, perennial theme 
basically, but uh, that's what you need. Uh, so agriculture really is, it, the reforms are a welcome thing because it dis distributes the agricultural income more favorably to the poor farmer. Uh, 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 but as far as GDP is concerned, uh, it, that's only to make a huge difference, you know, not even half percent uh, point, you know, not even point one or point two percent uh, uh, to the GDP. Thanks. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Professor. Before I go off, I'll just apologize once again. Not at all, sir. Not at all. <laughs> not sending you the link for today. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. It's all yours. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Professor. It was uh, very good. This thing you have argued very well how the economy is, uh, can bounce back, has the potential to bounce back to 7% uh, GDP growth. Uh, I have one question to ask, Professor. Uh, uh, the pre corona, the market was already, the GDP was slowing down, the growth rate. It was at uh, 4, 4.5, 4, four kind of a, this thing, and which used to be around 6.5, 7%. Slowly it's coming down. Unless that the reason for that is uh, addressed, uh, I'm I'm not sure whether it will bounce back. Only thing we can argue is that the stimulus package itself will be making a significant effect, whatever has been given. Therefore, it will bounce back. So I just wanted to understand your point of view because uh, still auto, I'm not sure how far that will recover post Corona. Like that, many industries which are struggling, and at the same time, a lot of uh, people's. Uh, am I there? Hello? Yeah. Yeah, okay. A lot of people, uh, this thing in terms of um, uh, sectors, a lot of sectors are affected. I'm not sure how far that will it will come back in, in terms of uh, economy bouncing back to the normal level. So that's that's the question. Real estate everywhere. I think the confidence to invest. People are not it. The businessman has to come forward to invest much more confidently. That is not there yet. Yes. So excellent question. And that is the million dollar question, really. So let's separate the two things. One is that, yes, the growth rate for eight quarters had been declining. Uh, you know, last quarter of seven, uh, last quarter of 2017-18, FY18, we grew 8.2%. After which the slide down happened, for eight quarters, uh, it, it slid down, came to 3.2% in the last quarter of 1920. Yeah, that's correct. And, and, and now we are in this decline of about 24%. So first point to note is that if there was no COVID, the economy would not be minus 24%. Maybe it will be uh, not, you know, 7, 8% or anything, but it would have grown at least 1, 2, 3%. Uh, and normally, you know, 3.2% was already low enough. It would have probably bounced back by this time. Uh, so lot of the current malaise that we see you know all around us pessimism is rooted in the in covid so that's one now what was the fundamental reason that this slide down happened right and you are absolutely right that unless we address that slide down uh, uh, to get back to you know so if you look at the first four years which ended in uh, 2017 18 march march 31 2018 those four years, the growth rate was 7.7%. So it was not uh, uh, it's something like 6% or something, you know, it was 7.7%. Uh, it's close, almost 8% if you round it off. Uh, that's where we need to go back. And, and, and I think my own uh, uh, analysis uh, and assessment is that the key factor behind it was really the financial sector. There was a lot of stress in the financial sector and finance is so incredibly important. You see, finance is like, uh, you know, water. It goes everywhere. And, and, and you know, if, 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 if finance is, uh, financial sector is in stress, then it filters through the entire economy. And so that needs to be addressed, which is why in my opening remarks, I, uh, one of the very, I mean, you know, very hurried remarks, but one thing I said, we need to recapitalize the banks now in anticipation because we have said we will restructure the loans. So that will certainly delay some of the bankruptcies and therefore it will delay the NPAs. But it will only delay. It's not going to stop them. So bankruptcies will happen. NPAs will rise up again. And what the big mistake we made 
uh, and and it was it, it I mean at least i was actually from within struggling very hard to ad- get the government to address the problem uh, uh, in the end like every other government you know npas problems are never get solved quickly they always you know governments are reluctant to move f- fast uh, we didn't you know so 2015 when we did indradhanush we allocated the 70000 crores to the recapitalization uh, and of course the clean up didn't even begin till uh, 2017 the ibc the the uh, the amendment to the banking regulation act which then led the rbi to instruct 12 of the largest uh, npas uh, uh, to go to the ibc uh, 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 that, that, that was in 2017 you know mid to late 2017 so that was delayed i think you know and we paid for it i mean we heavily paid for it because that then also spilled over into nbfc crisis you know banking and ps spilled over into the nbfc crisis in the end i think we ought to address the problem today uh, i think uh, we we you know the government has announced something like 20000 crores that is equivalent to the 70000 crores under indra dhanush in 2015 you need to go bigger uh, 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 today do it preemptively otherwise the same credit collapse will happen see we uh, reacted last time after the credit collapse had already happened in 2017 uh, early 2017 credit collapse had happened that's when the whole action began uh, we should not repeat that mistake uh, so that i think that is very critical i agree with you if we don't address that then going back to that 7.5 7.7% is going to be uh, at tough uh, going thanks professor i think we have uh, uh, though there are kind of this thing uh, people would love to ask questions i think we have to close this session now it is 45 minutes we have already delayed the session uh, sorry once again apologies for that professor no, no, no. so uh, it's my privilege to conclude this amazing session uh, professor panagriya it is a pleasure to hear you discuss the options to cure indian economy of the ill effects of the covid crisis you have laid out the problems and the solutions in an extremely simple and cogent way i am sure that our audience are, have uh, has understood the situation more clearly and they appreciate the pros and cons different approaches better now i also had the uh, this thing opportunity to read your article uh, on uh, 11th september in, in economic times i think that is, is some essence is what you spoke you have more elaborately spoken here i think i am very fortunate to get a much higher view as you have been saying timing uh, timing and uh, directing the stimulus is the key to the reviving economy uh, the supply side has been uh, given relief and booster shots to come out of the lockdown coma now as the supply chains are beginning to function again it may be time for a demand stimulus it is important to bring demand back in time to absorb the revive the production and accumulated stocks also india has to rethink its trade and investment strategy as we have been advocating india must remain open for the necessary imports because without imports no country can build global supply chains at the same time india must build alternatives to import that uh, that are better and cheaper in order to increase its share of value addition domestic capacity is also necessary to avoid a repeat of the supply chain disruptions indian companies must treat a reprieve from foreign competition as temporary they must use this wrinkle in global trade to become more efficient and innovative in in the longer run the world will go back to the specialists and the lowest cost suppliers the consumers patriotism cannot be taken for granted ultimately price is a measure of all these sentiments price and quality i would add 